Hi, this is Paul McGuire. This is a prophetic emergency alert, and we're going to deal uh, with the coronavirus, a global pandemic, through the lens or worldview of biblical prophecy. But most importantly, underscoring all the news coverage, I, I want to say something right up front. We're going to be giving you a lot of facts that you will not be, I, I doubt very seriously, that you, you're watching or hearing these facts on mainstream media. And they're important facts for you to know. But the most important fact, and I don't mean it as some kind of religious triviality statement, you know, like some, you know, not just some dumb statement to say because you can't think of anything better to say. But there, there's a deeper fact than, than the biomedical, the genetic, the pandemic facts, there's a deeper fact here that, that must be incorporated uh, into this battle against a, a deadly disease, the coronavirus, if indeed it is a virus. And that is this. You know, whatever the problem is in, in the United States, the world, whatever nation in human history, it's always the same dynamic that plays out over and over and over again, going back to thousands and thousands of years into mankind's history. You can read so much of it, uh, so perfectly transcribed by the, uh, Ju uh, the Jewish scribes who meticulously recorded the Old Testament and the entire account of the Jews and their relationship with the with the infinite personal living God of the universe, the God of Isaac, Abraham, uh, Abraham uh, and, and the God of the Jews, but not only the God of the Jews, the God of the Gentiles and the God of the Christians as well, as when Christ comes in the New Testament, there's the, the transference of the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, but that doesn't do away with God's relationship, of course, with the people of the old covenant, their their relationship, make no mistake about it, is 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 vital and vibrant. Depending upon the city, the street, and the person, obviously the same could be said with with Christians. Depending upon the inner spiritual vibrance of of people who call themselves the people of God, anybody, any group. Anybody can call themselves a person of God. I am a man of God. I'm a woman of God. I'm a, we are the people of God. Anybody can say that. It's cheap. It takes two seconds to say it. But as that old saying goes, uh, you know, just because you're in the, in the garage doesn't mean you're a car. You know, if you're in a two-car garage and you're standing in a two-car garage and one of the spots is empty, <laughs> you're not a car just because you're standing next to your wife's car or whatever the case may be. So we're going to talk about an underscoring truth, and that is, what is the nature of this reality that we live in as it pertains to this coronavirus threat and crisis, a global pandemic? What, it, what do we need to know about your reality, my reality, our, our collective reality? When I say collective reality, I'm not talking about an Eastern mystical, humanistic <clears throat> viewpoint which says you know like you can say it you can say new age eastern mystical uh, um, principles um, could be are simplified let's say in the lyrics of, of john lennon and and a lot of rock singers who who uh, performed or wrote songs some huge hit songs that try to give us an idea about the nature of our reality and lennon had a particular p uh, position and many of you may share the ex-Beatle John Lennon's position. And, and every New Year's Eve evening, uh, when people gather in Times Square, and I've been there many times because I'm, I'm from New York City, grew up in New York City, and uh, you see it on television wherever you are all over the world, if you're watching the New Year's Eve uh, celebration, 
as they all over the world they join in of all all songs to join in on as you move from the old year into the new year when the clock finally strikes midnight um, you will see that the world the vast majority I'm not saying the vast majority of people in our nation believe that but they act like they do a great deal of the time but of all the songs they could sing to, to bring in the new world for the fact that they're alive and they're going to enter a new year. They sing the song by John Lennon, Imagine There's No Heaven. And you know the lyrics. You know, imagine there's no countries. You know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But the point is, imagine there's no wars. It sounds just beautiful. It sounds like heaven on earth, doesn't it? It's really a tragic song to think that so many, probably billions of people worldwide, drunk or not, as they're bringing in the new year from Times Square, this collective global mega gathering. Do you think it's an accident that they're singing a testimony to John, the, the lyrics of John Lennon's song, which, which welcomed, what John Lennon wrote in that song, he welcomed in pra and praised this this humanistic, new age, mystical, psychedelic vision of mankind's future being one of a global government, a, a global economic system, and a global religion. Now, he says, and there will be no religion, but what, how that plays out is, yeah, there will, be, there will be no Christian religion, that's for sure. There will be no <coughs> uh, Jewish religion, that's for sure. And there won't be a lot of other religions, that's for sure. And on top of it, there'll be a lot of every other religion that shouldn't be in there will be in there. Because there are powerful, what, what it's called theologically is an ecumenical movement. A ec ecumenical movement is when you are willing to throw your core beliefs, your doctrines, what you believe the Bible is saying. You're willing to throw it in the trash for the sake of what you think in your human mind is a greater good, which is this global government, global religion, and global world, and global, godless global government. It's all godless, by the way. In fact, the very vision that John Lennon tragically is giving, giving us, and I was a fan of John Lennon's music when he was alive. I like a lot of his music now that he's gone wherever he chose to go to. I don't know where he went. He didn't believe in heaven, so I don't know where... Well, I know where the Bible said. The Bible makes it very clear. There's, two, there's two, two pathways on the road in life. One is eternal life in heaven with God forever and ever. And the other... This is according to the Bible. This is not according to Paul McGuire. The other possibility... There's only two possibilities for a person after they die. It's very clear that we understand this. And it doesn't come down to my opinion versus your opinion or my opinion versus John Lennon's opinion. It comes down to what is really real behind the, the illusion. I mean, you just stand there in Times Square. I've filmed a lot from there and, and videoed a lot from there. And it is it's, it's, the core of the matrix right now on planet Earth. But this, this illusory reality that Lennon, this dream, you know, it's interesting that that dream was, tri was uh, tried by mankind in ancient Babylon at the time of the Tower of Babel. And uh, in Genesis, uh, in, in the book of Genesis, there is a account, uh, a very uh, lengthy, detailed account of what happened in ancient Babylon at the time of the Tower of Babel. And what happened was that the people all became one, like John Lennon was calling for you know, will become like one. Well, that's what happened in ancient Babylon. They be, the people became like one. They, they only wanted to have, they were insistent upon it. They wanted a global government. They, did, they hated nationalism. It's very clear, and that's why I don't understand these confused Christian people and these confused Christian pastors and confused Christian seminarians and authors, etc., who I guess this is what happens when you don't read the word you say that you believe. So there's huge gaps in your thinking because you've got huge gaps in what you decided to read or not read in the Bible. And in the book of Genesis, very clearly, 
it talks about this global government, global Babylonian system, global economic system, and global religion. But it begins this passage of Scripture with a, a remark by God in which he says, the people have become one. So God comes down. He hears that there are bad things happening in ancient Babylon. So he comes down from heaven. Now, whether he came down from heaven or materialized, I mean, I don't know. The Bible says he came down from heaven, God, to check out um, Babylon and what the uproar was about. And what he saw, God didn't like. Now, when God looks into a situation, he has far more wisdom than we have. So he's looking at it through a multi-dimensional uh, perspective, and he has tremendous wisdom. And he could see that in the hearts of the men of, and women in ancient Babylon, they wanted to serve their god, Lucifer, and they wanted to l worship Lucifer uh, at their Luciferian, among other things. It was also technology, uh, the, the, the Tower of Babel that pyramidical tower that the Egyptians modeled their pyramids and, and God, Pharaoh God King's system afterward. So you have Babylon as a prototype of B the Bible prophecies, end time prediction of a last days global government in which there'll be the mark of the beast. You can't buy or sell without getting the mark of the beast. You can't... Um, uh, conduct, buy food, sell anything, unless you're part of this global, uh, I'm not saying it's going to be 5G, It's probably it will be probably something beyond 5G, but it'll be a whole lot faster than current 5G, let's put it that way. When you accept this uh, microchip implant, biochip implant, uh, many, many different names from it, uh, DNA implant, whatever they whatever they finalize on, and and these things are up. These chips and and uh, these technologies have been up and running for years now. Okay, they they could distribute them tomorrow if they wanted to for anything. So in ancient Babylon, they didn't have electronic chips. They it would have been a, a tattoo. Uh, and then you see God judges ancient Babylon specifically by dividing them up. Why was God so hung up about them being unified? It wasn't the unification that bothered God. It was the fact that they unified to conduct a mission or purpose of evil. That's what bothered God, and that's why he judged it. Also, Babylon is the city or the, the nation, the global nation of Satan or Lucifer. It's all about Luciferian worship. That's what it's really all about. It's about an all-out contest between two kingdoms. One is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, an eternal kingdom. And the other is not a real kingdom, but a pretender, Lucifer or Satan, who pretends to be God, but who is not God. And he, has, he says he has the kingdom. <clears throat> he says he has the keys of the kingdom. But according to... God's word, not according to what Lucifer said. Again, we have a choice. According to God's word, there's only one way into the kingdom of heaven, and that's putting your faith in Jesus Christ, or putting your faith in Yeshua, Messiah. Um, one entrance into heaven. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So that's an important foundational truth. Now, back to the, the uh, corona virus and the, the related um, um, pandemic challenges. On, on, multiple level, on multiple levels, we have um, a threat to our entire, they use this in military terminology, geopolitical terminology. Uh, I remember Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister of Israel, when referring to certain enemies of Israel that possessed nuclear weapons or, or who are perceived as going to have nuclear weapons in the future, Benjamin Netanyahu said they, that represents an existential threat to Israel's right to exist. So what he was saying in the strongest terms, when you say 
that something is an existential threat to your right to exist, and you're talking about nuclear missiles or soon to acquire nuclear missile nations, that is a kind of a slightly softer way of simply saying this nation Prime Minister of, of Israel is saying, this nation, if it does acquire or if it has already acquired nuclear missiles, that fact or reality, assuming what he's saying was true and proven, I have no idea, but if that fact was true or pro uh, proven, then the public statements made by many of the highest levels of government in this nation uh, have called for the obliteration of Israel and to, and to drive them into the sea. So if a nation has the power to do what they vocalize, a lot of people just talk a big talk, but if you're, you're talking about a nation which has the nuclear power or whatever to, to destroy an entire nation, and they, they've said publicly that's the, that that is their goal, any student of history knows we need to pay attention to when a dictator or a tyrant or whatever makes threats because almost 100% of the time if that dictator or, or leader of a dictatorship, if they do have the actual military power to do what they say they want to do, they almost 100% of the time do it. Th these dictators that you read about in history, they don't, first of all, they don't make threats like that unless they have the power to to you know, use nukes or whatever the equ equivalent was in whatever the time period was. They, they don't say things like that because that's an, that's an invitation to, hey, we are a dangerous threat. Come bomb us or, or come kill us. So they keep their mouths shut. In one hand, they pretend to be diplomatic. But on the other hand, they're secretly building nukes or whatever their plan is. That's very dangerous. So in a in a similar but yet not so similar manner with this global uh, uh, coronavirus breaking out as a, a pandemic, it's a threat to every man, woman, and child alive in every nation on planet Earth. But so are, uh, you know, many other things, starvation. There's all kinds of diseases and uh, mental disorders and all kinds of things that people will die from in far greater numbers I'm not, I'm not minimizing for a mi moment the potential devastation of the coronavirus, but let's remember something. There are easily, top of the mind, a hundred, easily, a hundred and thousands of more, in actuality, threats that are more, uh, that have a m vastly higher statistical percentage of bringing death to you, a loved one, or somebody you know. There are things that we do. I don't want to go through a list and, and, and generate collect more collective paranoia than is already there. But, I mean, we could go down a list of all kinds of things that we do every day. I mean, just driving in the freeway of Southern California, Los Angeles, California, where we broadcast from. I don't know what the actual statistics are, but the amount of people who are die seriously injured or whose lives who are destroyed as a result of just driving on our freeways, just this is in one area of the United States, is huge. I'm sure it vastly, vastly surpasses any statistics on the spread of the coronavirus. And there are many, many other things like food poison. I mean, you could go down an entire list of, of things that, that come about from much more boring and mundane and, and ordinary life, but we're not freaking out out of our minds. That does, again, does not minim minimize the danger.
But back to this viewpoint of reality. Let us remember that even though it, this is taught as being normal, death is not normal and death is not natural. Even though every one of us will eventually die unless you happen to be a believer in that particular time period when the Lord returns, then you will experience the, the, transform, the supernatural transformation of your body. Okay? But everybody else, when they die, and it's always, everything always sooner or later is natural causes. But when everybody dies, and everybody does, um, of whatever, old age, but it's, it's, n it's never, quote, old age per se. It's whatever your, your lowered immunity system as your body degrades over time um, makes you more vulnerable to diseases and aging and eventually dying. But, you know, there was no such thing as death when God created the human race in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. There was no such thing as death. They, they lived. They were built. They were genetically designed by God. God created the DNA of Adam and Eve to be immortal, eternal, and live forever. The only reason what is called the death force got activated and infected the human race was Adam and Eve decided to believe what Lucifer was telling them to the b believe through the serpent, who was very charismatic, seductive. I'm not talking about sexual. I'm talking about seductive in a, a, br a greater sense of the word. Charismatic personality, Lucifer amplified the charismatic personality of a being that we would describe as a serpent um, who seduced, not in the sexual sense, it was like in the sense of spiritual dis seduction. He got Adam and Eve to reject obeying God's word and to do what God, for the only thing God said, don't do. Don't eat from the, uh, the fruit of the tree in the middle of the Garden of Eden. And they did it. The second they did it, they activated the uh, law of sin and death, or the death force. Because they chose to sin, and they broke God's only law, that tripped a, a cosmic switch, if you will, and instantaneously the inner DNA, the inner genetics of Adam and Eve were instantaneously transformed, and they went from immortal to mortal human beings in a nanosecond. Pow! They knew they were naked, they were ashamed, they were afraid, and then they recognized they were dying. And they did die. The average lifespan back then was approximately around 900 years old. This is before the flood of man. And um, prior to this point, nobody ever died and nobody ever got sick, period. And there was no violence or crime either. So man, every man and woman would have lived eternally. That was alive. But what interrupted it was the activation of the law of sin and death. This is the primary reason why Christ returned uh, and came to planet Earth to begin with. Jesus Christ died before the foundation of the world as the lamb, to be the Lamb of God. Why did he have to be the Lamb of God? Because there's a, there's, a, there's a chasm or a great wall between men and women, uh, and, and, and women and men and God, and both the male and female and God, and, and there's a distance between uh, us as people, mothers, fathers, hus husbands, wives. There's a separation, but the, mo the, the most powerful disruptive se separation is the separation. It's, li it's like a spiritual separation between us, us human beings, and God. And that spiritual separation is called sin. It's a force, it's a death force, if you will. And that causes the human body to, to degrade and eventually die. Now, we don't deal with this because our society and, and a lot of the affluence in our society has embraced the worldview of humanism, secular humanism, and so-called scientific materialism, in which they believe in evolution versus um, creation as, as an account of how man came into being. But they don't have an explanation for death, not even close. So, when you talk about the coronavirus and you go to the, the fundamental elements of what a virus or any sickness is, pathogen, pa pandemic, bacteriological, 
viral, whatever it is, whatever causes it, a toxin or whatever, it came about from the law of sin and death being activated. Because remember, prior to that, there was no death, no sickness, no disease of any kind. Man was eternal. When we violated the law of God, it tripped a trigger. Just because our brains are too small to understand the complexity of the trigger that our ancestors tripped, doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It just means that we live in an age, especially our age, with social media saturation. We live in an age, you know, there should be a book written, living, there probably is one very close to it, living for dummies or something, because this generation and many generations before, we've been deliberately dumbed down to be compliant, non-thinking, non-questioning. But that reduces your ability to approach reality with a razor edge sharpness, which is required to be victorious in this reality, to be victorious in the physical realm, the material realm, as well as the spiritual realm. That's why the Apostle Paul said these words. And you should be meditating on these words, not meditating on images of fear, meditating on these words, because these are the words of God in his word, the Bible. The Apostle Paul says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Fear of any kind you, you, sh you should reject, because not only is fear a psychological programming, uh, not only is uh, fear al always self-defeating, uh, but fear is also a, an interrupter of the life force that comes between you and God. The there's a power that comes from God to you. Or there's a power that would, would like to come from God to you. See, many of you are in a moment of fear and existential crisis because this represents a potential threat to your children, grandchildren, people you know, yourself, elderly, whatever. It's, 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 a, it's a massive potential threat to people's life, to people's ability to work in every aspect of their life. And it causes a great deal of psychological trauma. And some people are more easily traumatized than others. But the point is, and this is the entire message of the Bible, and I don't want to get into the entire thing. Obviously, we don't have time. We're trying to focus on taking biblical truth and applying it to one crisis because this is what's preoccupying us now, the coronavirus. But the biblical foundation here is that Jesus Christ and the Bible teach us that all sickness and disease and death, the biblical worldview tells us and teaches us and educates us that death, sickness, and disease are not normal, they're not natural. They should be perceived as enemies, or just, that's fine, per perceive them as enemies. Like, you know, an enemy force or enemy soldiers with the enemy's weapons attacking you, trying to destroy you, take you over. That's, what, that's how God wants us to perceive sickness and disease. I think it would, it would reflect either stupidity or a lot, and I don't, I'm not, I don't mean this in a condescending sense, but it would reflect either stupidity or a lack of wisdom to presume when you're analyzing the misfortune of somebody else. It's a very dangerous place to be for any of us, myself included, when we place ourselves in, in the seat of judgment or we look down upon somebody else and said, oh, God must be judging them, or they wouldn't have had this happen to them, or that happen to them, or they wouldn't have this sickness, or that disease or sickness. God must be mad uh, against specifically them, and because they're not holy or righteous like, quote, I am, uh, then that's God's punishing them because of what they did. That is a very, very slippery slope for any one of us, including me and you, to, to place ourselves in the seat of God and to act like we can pronounce judgments as if God can. 
you better stay away from that one because you're not God and you don't know how God applies his law uh, and when he applies the full weight of his law, when he holds back. The Bible talks about this. It's, not, it's, not, it's simple in the sense that if you do not eventually repent and come to, to Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you are going to spend eternity separated from God. Okay, that, that's a fact. Because the only, there's only one way to get into heaven, and that's through faith in Christ. Why? Because Christ was the only being that ever lived that came from heaven with the antidote or the cure, if you will, for this fatal disease called death. Only, only Christ has ever claimed to, to remove uh, sickness and death because he came, his body, he came as the antidote for, for sin and death. So that's the perspective that I want to um, um, come at this from, from this, from this foundation. Because, first of all, there should be no death whatsoever. Second of all, when there's a breach in the wall or an existential threat like the one I just described with the coronavirus, it's a threat, but that doesn't mean that God wants you to be uh, victimized by the threat. Just like you, if you were to guard yourself against a physical enemy, you would need certain uh, uh, tools to, to protect yourself against a physical enemy. Building up your immune system, I mean, this builds up your, it strengthens your body. If your body is weak and you're doing nothing to, to revitalize it, and nothing to build up the immune system in terms of food, nutrients, herbs, seeing a qualified doctor and, and bouncing your opinions off of him before embarking on any change because every person's situation is different. This is why we, we need medical doctors. But you need, you, need, you need to find the right medical doctor who understands your situation. Because underneath all this is this law of sin and death. But God wants us to approach an attack that is both spiritual and natural, physical, biological, as well as, again, spiritual. He wants us to approach that with the same mindset that Jesus Christ approached sickness and disease. And the Old Testament teaches us how to approach sickness and disease. And Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul called death the enemy. The Bible refers to death in numerous places as the enemy, and sickness and disease as an enemy. So, the first area of your defense has to be in your mind, because if you think that it's God's will, and some people do, depending upon their religious beliefs, depending upon how they poorly they misinterpret the Bible, they believe that it's God's will for them to be sick. They believe it's God's will, therefore, in a sense, they kind of welcome and send out an invitation to the sickness or the disease, or the coronavirus, or whatever it happens to be. If you're opening yourself up to something, then there's probably a multi-dimensional answer, but you're you're making your spiritually yourself spiritually vulnerable to something. If you open yourself up to something biologically, let's say you participate in activities. When I say activities, I'm not simply talking about the sexual area. I'm talking about any activity from eating to uh, sanitization habits, washing your hands, not you know. Uh, all the other things they've been talking on the news about, about physical proximity, etc. This all is a physical defense, keeping your distance, protecting your body from receiving things uh, that would transmit disease, F things that increase the transmission of disease factors, and the re receptivity. People who allow their immune systems to, to go low through bad diet, not exercising, not resting, or whatever the reason may be, stress, I don't know. The, the, the lowered immune system, which it can be, can be a byproduct of a weakened immune system. And so we have to fight it, but it begins with a mentality that I'm not going to uh, praise the Lord that uh, I have a virus. No, your attitude is that you're going to defeat the virus. And so you pray, and then you do everything your doctor tells you to do. You keep abreast of the latest medical reports. You write down 
the things that you're hearing, common sense things like wash your hands with certain uh, uh, antibacterial, antiviral things. This is how, it's a multidimensional battle. So you begin the battle with prayer. Then you move in right along with common sense, nitty gritty, practical things like, guess what? Washing your hands and, san and sanitization, okay? If you, if you, I mean, that's like 101, health hygiene 101. Wash your hands. Now, number two is, you've got to pray for God's supernatural protection, his guidance, and a hedge of protection around yourself. Number two, and number three, pray for healing. The entire New Testament is packed, and the Old Testament is filled with healing verses, promises from God to heal you if you'll simply ask God to heal you. So, Jesus comes in the New Testament. Everyone who came to Jesus, Jesus healed. Jesus, by the way, did not put an expiration date on that promise. That promise is still active. And in the Old Testament, there were countless promises to the Jews about if they obeyed the law and they walked in faith and righteousness to the law of God, that God would supernaturally heal them. In fact, he said, I will not put any of the uh, uh, sicknesses or diseases of Egypt upon you. That's going to become more important in this prophetic emergency alert as you watch more of these. The relationship between Egypt and the diseases that can come upon us. I talk about that in my new book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. And I devote chapters on uh, contagions, viral pathogens, things like that. But I also devote time on a study of how God miraculously he d delivered his children in ancient Egypt. And they, as you all know, painted the, uh, the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of their homes as a sign to the death angel that you, you are to pass over this house, the Passover lamb. You were to pass over this house because why? Not because of the not because of the righteousness of the people, but you were to pass over my house because I have appropriated the blood of the sacrificial lamb of Israel as a cleansing over my sins. So pass over, death angel. Today in America, many Christians, because they're not walking in a vital supernatural relationship with Jesus Christ, forget that we don't have to go kill a lamb and paint uh, an actual lamb's uh, blood on the doorpost of our home. But by faith, we have every right to apply spiritually the blood of Jesus Christ over the doorposts of our home by claiming that Old Testament promise and asking God that all sickness and disease would pass over from your house, like the Passover lamb. But our Passover lamb is Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, I have met Christians in, in some of the toughest, most outrageously dangerous areas, and sometimes they'll be so caught up in the emotion or the fear that they'll forget to pray. So before you do anything else, I'm going to ask you, you want to pray the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, over your dwelling, over where you're, and then you use common sense, of course. You use common sense. Because what happened? The death angel could not kill the people who put the blood of the Lamb on their doorposts. And God answers prayer today. Let's join me, would you, in a quick prayer? Visit paulmcguire.us. We have written updates, written teaching, as well as video teaching and uh, audio teaching and programs and updates on this at paulmcguire.us. And spread this message and help us get this message out. Join me in prayer, would you? And then place your hand on your door at some point. And uh, if you, you have to believe, okay, it only takes a mustard seed of faith. So if you've got a mustard seed of faith, then why don't you join me with prayer? And let's apply the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, on the doorposts of our hearts, okay? And ask God for supernatural protection. Join me in prayer. Say, say it from your heart, or you can just repeat the words that I'm going to say out loud. Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you <clears throat> praising your name, Jesus. 
We thank you, Lord, that the blood of the Lamb has cleansed us of all sin, past, present, and future, and that, Jesus, you are that Lamb. You are the Lamb of God who died before the foundation of the world to come here and die on a cross for our sins. So when you died on a cross, Jesus, you took away all of our sins, including the ultimate sin, which is death, the final enemy. You destroyed death, Jesus, by taking the punishment of death and all the sins associated with death. When you took all of our sins, my sins and your sins included, upon yourself when you died on a cross. And because of that factual reality in history, <clears throat> We thank you, Jesus, that we have been justified not by our self-righteousness or our works, but we are made holy and justified by the blood of the Lamb, or made holy by the blood of the Lamb. You've cleansed us from all of our sins, past, present, and future, and you've cleansed us from death. In fact, Lord Jesus, in the same prayer, if, the, if you have not done this yet, you need to ask God to say a prayer in, middle, in the middle of a prayer and say, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I am a sinner. Go ahead and say it. He knows it's true. You know it's true, so you might as well just say it. Jesus, forgive me uh, for my sins. I'm a sinner. And I ask you, Jesus, right now to cleanse me of all of my sin. You don't have to say it out loud, but you need to say it and mean it. I ask you, Jesus, to cleanse me of all of my sin right now. And right now, Jesus, I invite you to come into my life and make me born again by the Spirit of God. Lord, I thank you that you just saved me because I put my faith in you. I am now born again, which means I've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, from all my sins. It also means, as a fact guaranteed by God and his word, that you are now guaranteed entrance into heaven to live eternally. You're granted the gift of eternal life from God to live in heaven for all eternity because you put your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you. Now, maintain that attitude of prayer, and when it's convenient, now or whenever, you're going to lay your hand on a door, like I'm laying my hand on this, um, these articles. You're going to lay your hand on your door. Do it from the inside or outside. That depends on your faith. I would do it on both sides, all the doors, all the entrance ways. And literally say, Jesus, in, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I ask that the power of the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, would be fully appropriated on all my doorposts and the windows of my dwelling. And then you can pray that prayer by faith for people that you know and love and are concerned about or people the Lord puts in your heart. You don't even have to physically be there. God will enter the, enter the prayer. But in your own dwelling, you should obviously place your hand physically in your doorways. Lord Jesus, I ask you to uh, cleanse my doorways, the people in the home, with the blood, your blood, Jesus. And as you did for ancient Israel, you commanded the, the angel of death to pass by or pass over the house of all the Jews who were obedient to God's word and painted the blood of an actual lamb on their doorposts. Their, the, the lives of their children were spared. And those in the highest uh, offices of Egypt, their children were not spared. God, now, I'm not, that doesn't give up me the right to, to, to judge if somebody is sick or, God forbid, passes on. It's not for me to, just, to say, oh, you know, I'm not the judge. Forget about it. You're not the judge. You were never supposed to be sitting in, in the courtroom acting like the judge. God is the judge. You just be who you're supposed to be. I'm, I be who I'm supposed to be and let God be the judge. That's not my job. That's not your job. And you pray and you ask God to bind all sickness and disease, all harm, all evil, and name it by name. And in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I ask you to b bind the coronavirus, any associated pandemic, or any other disease, or any other evil from coming into my entrance or out from my uh, exit and harming anyone in my family or exterior in any way, shape, or form. In Jesus' name, I thank you that the hand of Jesus is upon every doorway in my house. Yeshua, Messiah, yes, he is the God of Israel, but you've got to claim it, and you can say it in your own words. 
but that's a good starter. Now, if you've done that, then visit us and keep getting more resources, more updates on how you can win this spiritually as well as other ways. Visit paulmcguire.us. Spread this message far and wide. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire.